Mike Bamberg. Uh, I'm a glider pilot, uh, airplane pilot. Um, as I was mentioning to some other people earlier, my father was a glider pilot, so uh, it runs in my blood. I haven't had any of my kids pick it up yet, but I've got one that's kind of interested in a couple of grandkids that say they're going to, so who knows? We'll see. Um, this is a, uh, a glider flight in Logan last August. One of the things that we do, and it's important to the understanding of racing uh, in the United States, actually worldwide, we have in our glider a small electronic device that is a GPS logger. Uh, it also has a pressure sensor so it knows the altitude. So we can set it up so it logs a point every four seconds, or every one second. There's actually enough memory. So in this particular case, and you see those circles? Those circles are climbing in a thermal. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's one of the sources of lift. The other source of lift is when I was cruising on the ridge, wind going over the ridge has to go up. Now this glider that I'm flying in normal flight loses about 200 feet a minute. So as long as the air that I'm in is going up faster than 200 feet a minute, I'll climb. And so when you see these circles, in that particular case, I was losing 150 feet a minute, but the air was going up at about 1,000 feet a minute. And I was climbing at what we call eight knots. So, it's quite, uh, so we're doing it again here. Um, and the reason the line is laying diagonally is because the wind is blowing the lift. And so I'm following the lift as it blows downwind. Um, so we carry these uh, logging devices. And then when we're racing, we start off with an assigned number of turn points. And I'm going to show you a different picture in just a moment. Hi, Mark. Um, and these turn points are defined as the task for the day. And so we go launch and then fly these points around as quickly as we can. Um, one of the things that people have a misunderstanding about, you know, you look at this glider up here. Uh, I almost bought one of these a while back. Might have even been this one before it was restored. Um, this glider has a glide ratio around 30 to 1 which means that for every foot it drops, it has the potential to go forward 30 feet. My glider has a glide ratio around 40 to 41 to 1. So for every foot I lose, I can potentially go further. But if you look at, you know, it's going to take off here in a moment. I just land. Come on, take off. Here we go. Uh, what you're going to see down here, there's a, this is LD, that's lift to drag. That's my glide ratio. And uh, right now I'm being towed by a glider, a, a power plane. And you see this, the, the line is roughly red and yellow. That means I'm climbing. And in a moment, it'll turn blue. And when it turns blue, that means I've released from the glider, uh, from the tow plane. There I am. And now I'm on the ridge. So now, until I land, any time that line turns uh, orange or red, I'm climbing. And my logger is telling me that. So if you look over in the lower left, there's a wind sock. It's showing that the wind is blowing almost directly onto the ridge. And I'm getting lift by the air going over the top of the ridge. We call that ridge soaring, which is quite popular here in Hood River, as you might imagine. Uh, we've got a wonderful ridge here. It's just not very long. <laughs> now, now I'm headed on the ridge. Well, actually, because I haven't circled yet, it tells me that I'm traveling quite a distance because I'm not circling. But you look here, it says I went 127 miles with an average glide ratio of minus 438. Another way to look at that is I flew for an hour and almost an hour and 45 minutes, had an altitude change total of 17,000 feet. So I, I didn't lose, I gained over an hour and 45 minutes without stopping to turn. So now I'm running down the ridge, uh, pretty much, <laughs> and uh, headed northbound. And uh, I'm going to go up, 
about, uh, gosh, I don't know, 50 miles, turn around, come back, and then go back up again, and then cross the valley. Uh, this is the Cache Valley of northern Utah. And uh, anyway, so, you know, looking, this particular program, by the way, is called CU, I-C-U, <laughs> CU, and we can use our data logger, feed it into here, and see what we've accomplished on a given flight. It's very good for analysis of what you're doing. But we can take this same data log and compare it to someone else that's flying the same day or the same task that we're flying. So I'm going to show you a different trace here. We're going to stop this one. And I'll show you a little different trace and, and give you an idea uh, what goes on there. Let's see. single flight. 
Now they use they use the kind of lift that this one did. They were using uh, ridge and what's called wave. That's the type. I don't have an example of here. Uh, in order to keep aloft and go fast, uh, so they flew for a little over 13 hours at 100 over 100 miles an hour for 13 hours in a glider, no engine. <laughs> So again, back to someone said, oh, glider's racing. How does a glider race? Well, in the right conditions, it can go quite a bit faster than light aircraft and stay aloft far longer. Yeah, you and don't have to refuel. What's that? You don't have to refuel. Well, you know, we're using the, the best source of fuel in the, in the solar system. Uh, all of our energy actually comes from the interaction of the sun on the surface of the earth. The sun doesn't charge it. <laughs> and the charge, it doesn't charge us, and, um, and you know, at this point, and probably for our lifetime, it's going to stay there. We talk about thermals, which you've seen soaring birds go round and round and round and round. They're just climbing in a thermal. And then we have the ridge, which I, I showed you a picture of. But we also uh, have something called wave. And wave is um, very prominent here in uh, Hood River. In fact, uh, some of the best soaring way in the state of Oregon is here in this valley. So if you think about it, here's a mountain. I know it doesn't look like a mountain, but that's what it is, a side view of a mountain. Now, if that was a rock in the middle of a stream, the water's flowing over the rock, and what happens on the downstream side? You get a ripple, right? And you know, every time you see a rock in the water, you get a ripple. It doesn't go flat after it goes over the rock. Well, one of the things that we need to be aware of is that the atmosphere around us is a fluid. And anything we see in water, we can have that same phenomenon, although we don't necessarily see it, in the air. So we've got this wonderful place here, place right here, Mount Hood. That's Mount Hood in this particular picture. And the air comes over this ridge, this mountain, and it gets ripples on the back side of it. And so you get in that up air, and you go up. Now, thinking of a ripple, there's an upside and a downside. downside. <laughs> so you want to avoid the downside and stay in the upside. So it's kind of like surfing. You know, in surfing, the wave is moving, and the surfer rides the upgoing edge of the wave. In our case, the wave is stationary, and we ride the upgoing side of the wave. And we can do that for hours and hours on end. Duration is no longer accepted for world records. Because when they decided to discontinue world records for duration in a glider, it was two and a half days. And a single person in a confined glider for two and a half days, <laughs> beyond that, and, and flying for that length of time, day and night, becomes a uh, physical hazard. <laughs> so they no longer accept those kinds of records, and people don't attempt them anymore. Um, all right, this is uh, a flight that was flown from um, North Plains. How many of you have heard the name Richard Van Grunsman? Dick Van Grunsman. Okay? You don't know Dick Van Grunsman. Well, I'm going to deviate slightly from the topic. But he built the RV4, so a lot of people would know him as that. Yeah, so yeah. RV4. RV4, RV6, oh, RV 6, uh, RV six 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, mm -hmm. and right now 14. These, it is the most popular home built aircraft in the world. There have been more of that, that uh, aircraft model series built than all other home-built aircrafts worldwide. Over, over 12,000 at this point. Built by this fine gentleman, very modest man, unassuming, doesn't like attention, Dick Van Grunsman. He's also a glider pilot. And a very, very good glider pilot. This was his best flight this last year. I want you to look at the scale here for just a moment. Up here, that's Mount St. Helens. Down here, this is west of Salem. 
So he flew from his, he, he owns a home on an airfield north of Hillsboro. He flew from there, went south a little ways, went north just past, almost up to Kelso, down to Salem, north up to uh, Mist, again down to Salem, and then all the way up, no, I may get to see, no, that's right, all the way up to Spirit Lake and back down to his home. One flight. I'm going to give you, show you the statistics on this one. Here's a nice afternoon flight. <laughs> it was a very nice afternoon flight. There were actually three people. I was out of town that day. I really, really was unhappy. Um, so he, he flies a motor glider. That's how he launches. And he, he turned the motor on for five minutes to climb up. And then he was six hours flying. Now look at those numbers that we looked at. His glider has a glide ratio around 50 to 1. But overall, he had a glide ratio of around 77. He climbed a total of uh, 33,000 feet total time. Uh, 32 total time. He only stopped to third circle 23 times in six hours. <laughs> His average speed was 96 miles an hour for six hours. It's almost 600 miles. Now, why am I giving you all this other detail? Because I think you can see that in the right conditions, racing is a very natural outcome. <laughs> racing, I mean, people want to compete, right? Now, this image that I have here was actually, there is a website that we all like to do. And so the first part of racing I'm going to talk about here is something called OLC. And that stands for Online, uh, online Contest. Oh, by the way, that's my instrument panel. Uh, so, over here is, this is my altimeter, and that's my airspeed indicator. And over here is something called a variometer, or a vertical speed indicator, except this one is really an air data computer. It, it, it gives me airspeed, true airspeed, outside air temperature, rate of climb, rate of climb of the air mass. It gives me a, a tremendous amount of information in a little instrument that's only two and a quarter inches in diameter. I have a GPS behind. Uh, the GPS feeds that instrument and then feeds this instrument. And this is my moving map display. Now, if you look up there, you can see some circles. Can you see those circles up there in a triangle going from circle to circle? That's the task I was flying that day. And that's the way we do a cross country, is we, uh, we, we all decide beforehand we're going to fly from here to here to here and back again, see who does it fastest. So in that particular day, the big circle is, is North Plains. Uh, the little circle is one called the Black Radar Ball. Over on the uh, left-hand side is a place called Dorman Pond, and then come back. And the idea is to go around that as quickly as you can. On this particular year, I think the fastest one was about, so that, that works out to be about 62 or 63 miles. The fastest one was 45 minutes. That's pretty good speed. Um, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this is my control stick here. You see a whole bunch of buttons and switches on it. Uh, one lower one says PTT. That's push to talk. That's so I can talk on my radio to people. The rest of them allow me to control that screen. Make it bigger, make it smaller, change points, get all kinds of information. So when I'm flying my glider, which people tend to think is being very simple and unsophisticated, I have better electronics than most airliners. <laughs> Down here is my transponder, this is my radio, and this box that's got the glare on it right now is a backup for everything in the cockpit. A little box that big. Airspeed, uh, ground speed, doesn't give me airspeed. Altitude, rate of climb, moving map, 
all of the pieces of information that I want to have cost $700. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing what I have at my disposal in order to do what I'm trying to do in terms of going fast. Uh, a lot of the information that I need to make very quick and valid decisions are coming off of these two boxes, or three boxes. Um, in addition, I have, like I said, I have a transponder, but I also have a flight aware system. It's a traffic awareness system. And if you look in the screen, up on the top, you see that black radar. It shows me where all the other traffic is. So <laughs> it's, it's a very comprehensive set of information to make it so that when I'm flying, I can make very good decisions. Uh, with what I've done. And most people who are racing or have been racing for some period of time have something, some similar capability in their aircraft, <coughs> whether it be a, a single box like that one or a more sophisticated suite of instruments like mine. Um, all right, so what was I going to show you? I was going to show you OLC. So we can go to a contest. There's one held in Euphreda. Washington almost every year. Uh, we can go to a contest and, and fly with a whole bunch of other people, and um, the aircraft are divided into different classes of aircraft depending on various characteristics of the uh, aircraft. So just like you, if you had a, a car race, a car race, you could be racing a stock car, you could be racing a drag racer, you could be racing a Formula One, and in gliders, we have the same sort of um, <laughs> not today, I'm not. There we go. Uh, we have the same sort of separation. We can um, we can separate by a wingspan, by the capabilities of um, let's try a that's probably. Maybe not. <laughs> Let's try a different thing. Uh, Let's try the day I flew it. There we go. Uh, Monday. Did I miss it? Let's see. Yeah. I'm, not, uh, I'm not pulling up anything good here. Just a second. One more time. August. Okay, so there's a bunch of people. There's my buddy, uh, Tom Roth. So we had, uh, we had on this day five people that uh, uploaded to the web their, the contents of their little logger. And so they can see how other people in the same area got to fly. On this particular day, you can see where they're flying from, Evergreen, North Plains, uh, Kelly Cooper and Paul Woolery were flying from here, and uh, Matt Keegan was flying from North Plains. So you see Tom, he got a score, and Matt got a score, and a guy named Tim Hennigan up in uh, Evergreen, he got a score. But let's look at Tom's, just because I know Tom and I can pick on him. <laughs> Tom is actually my, uh, you know, you, you have good flying buddies. He's my good flying buddy. We need a lot of flying together. <clears throat> okay, so he flew for uh, two hours and 21 minutes. That number is uh, in the pink area there at the bottom. And uh, we get scored in this particular contest, we get scored on two things. Distance and a triangle that can be inscribed inside the points that we flew. And uh, in this case, you look up there, he flew a distance that was scored at 121 kilometers and a triangle that was scored as 18 kilometers. And there's some rules about how big the triangle can be, because you could probably draw a bigger triangle, but it wouldn't meet the rules. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me turn off a couple things here really quick. So I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of faint. Um, but the triangle, the triangle is right here. It goes from here to there, to there, and back again. Okay? 
And so that triangle is the biggest triangle that meets the rules in the flight that he did. And then the rules for distance have to do with the longest legs in your flight. So he came out here, went back up here, zigzagged back and forth a couple times. Actually, he probably did that first. And then came uh, back and, and came home. So that's, that's a contest that everybody in the world can participate in on a daily basis. So it's called OLC. And oftentimes, anymore, you know, we talk about racing, and I'm going to talk about racing from a contest standpoint in just a moment. But this has pretty much become the thing that glider pilots do. I'm going to go fly today. I'm going to post on OLC. I'm going to see if I got better than anybody else. Um, and in this particular case, when we were looking at the five people that were listed for the Pacific Northwest, and that's what we were seeing, the five people that were listed for the Pacific Northwest were all um, flying, well, except for a couple of them, were flying in different places. So Kelly Cooper and Paul were flying here from uh, this airport, and uh, Matt and Tom were flying from North Plains, and Tim was out there doing his own thing, which he does. <laughs> but this particular scoring system also takes into account that this glider and that glider have different performances. So if I go further with a poor glider, I get a much better score than someone that went the same distance in a much better glider. I like it. What that means is that I can compete on a fairly level field in terms of performance of the glider. Now we're just measuring the performance of the pilot. So, uh, any questions there before I move on? Questions? I'm probably going much longer than I'm supposed to. No, you're good. Oh, so far so good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the real competition that is still recognized by the Soaring Society of America and the international organizations. And these, these contests tend to be um, quite large. In fact, right now, in Lake Keep It, <laughs> the name of the place, uh, Australia, let's see. Uh, <coughs> right now, the world championship for uh, you at the world women's competition is taking place in. Um, Australia. And we have three competitors. Uh, we have three competitors from the United States. Uh, one of them, Sarah Arnold, lives in Tennessee, runs a glider port there. Uh, she placed second or third two years ago, and it looks like she might win this year. So, kind of fun. Uh, so, Sarah Arnold there, Kathy Fosha, and uh, Sylvia Grandstaff. Uh, John Good, a friend of mine, is the team captain. And so they're there right now. Let's see what the results are. I wonder if they're racing with all the fires that are going on down there. They, they had a bit of a problem with that for a while, but... Uh, oh, come on. There we go. Let's try that. Maybe you can get the scores there somewhere. Um, go to soaring spot. Which one? Soaring spot. Oh, soaring yeah, spot. Um, that's got a great way to look at all the results in the play. Spell that right? No. I think it's got an NG in there. I think this website's developed by the sea, you guys. Yeah. Soaring spot. Soaring spot. Is that a word? Or? I think it's Bob. several days, these are the current standings. Uh, Sarah's not up there. Oh, that's the daily winner. Uh, <coughs> so Sarah's flying in uh, standard class. Remember I talked about different classes. So she's still in first place by 200, 
200 points more or less. That's, that's cool. The AUSA. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, the, the other two ladies are uh, not doing quite as well. Uh, they had a pretty tough, they got smoked out a couple times. So uh, they're down, Sylvia's down at 16 and Kathy's down at 13. Um, which in the U.S., uh, we don't always do very well, in, <laughs> unfortunately, in the uh, competitions. Um, where is the... Test center is in the pool. Must be a bad day. <laughs> Where is the pass? Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. So what you can see here is uh, the list of turn points that are going to be used for uh, the attempt, which was actually almost two days ago, our time. Uh, so they went to these one, two, three, six turn points, a total of uh, 435 kilometers. Um, so multiply that times 0.62, and you come up with mm, roughly 20, 250 miles or thereabouts. So 250 <coughs> miles uh, was their task, uh, and in this particular in this particular race. You see the thing that says cylinder radius? That's what they are, it's cylinder radius. The radius is only a half a kilometer. So you actually have to get over in that cylinder. It's only a half a kilometer. That's 500 meters in radius. That's a pretty, pretty tiny little spot <laughs> that you have to go to. And, uh, and they all have to go around that. So let's see, I don't think I can get a track here. Maybe I can. No, all right, that's what it looks like. So they're flying, uh, they're flying out of the airport where the red dot is, and then they launch, they launch up to the northwest, and that's the start line. So we've got to cross that start line, go around this point, around that point, that point, that point, and come back home again. Uh, those of you that are pilots understand that there are certain air spaces where we can't fly. And if you look over here, this kind of keyhole shape area is a uh, do not fly zone. You cannot go in there. You'll be immediately disqualified when you get back and you turn in your trace. So you got to stay in the, you know, you get mighty close to it right down here. Maybe the best lift is right there, but you can't go there. <laughs> and how do you know where it is? You have a moving map display just like I have in my cockpit, and it shows me the extent of all of the different kinds of uh, restricted air spaces. So we call this race an assigned race. That is to say, each point is assigned. We can also modify this just a little bit and make the radius of those circles much larger so that you can turn anywhere inside a much larger area. That's the type of competition that I fly. It's used in sports class in the United States. And uh, you basically have a minimum distance you could fly if you just nick the little corner of all the air spaces, or you can go way deep into each of the circles and get a long distance. So I'm going to stop here for just a moment, talk about the different classes of gliders that are typically flown. Now there's other classes. I'm not going to cover every single one. We don't have all day. Well, we do, but I'm not. <laughs> um, if you go out and look in some of the gliders we have here in the museum, uh, the big white, the nice white one that just got recently donated is called a Lavelle. I owned one of those for a time. That was what my father used to fly. It has a 15 meter wingspan. It has retractable landing gear. It has flaps all along the trailing edge. That's called a 15 meter glider. Okay. So it basically, the only restriction is the wingspan cannot be greater than 15 meters. Now this aircraft, when it was originally designed, fit into a different class called standard class. What did that mean? Well, it didn't have a retractable landing gear, and it doesn't have any flaps. But it has a 15 meter wingspan, and that's called standard class. 
So the two ladies that are flying in Keep It in Lake Keep It are flying in the standard class. No, they're flying in the club class. Uh, Sarah's flying, or Sarah's flying in the standard class. Standard class today, the only change from this ship, in other performance is improved, is that you can now have a retractable landing gear. But other than that, the limitation is not a very sophisticated airplane, no flaps, nothing like that, and the <coughs> span is limited to 15 meters. From that, we jump into a number of other classes. So, for example, uh, there's open class where everything goes. The wingspans in the open class have reached over 28 meters. That's a 100 foot <coughs> wingspan. Wow. Okay. Um, they roll real slow. <laughs> They're a little harder to control. But when you're looking for performance, uh, the highest performance gliders right now in the open class have glide ratios in excess of 60 to 1. Let me put that in a different perspective for you. My glider has a glide ratio around 40 to 1. If I'm at 10,000 feet, <clears throat> I cannot see the furthest point I could land at. Uh, it's too far away. I have been in a flat glide from 10,000 feet to the finish line of a, of a contest at about 100 uh, knots for 25, 35 minutes. At 100 knots, and I still get back above 2,000 feet above the field. I have to, by the way. That's a rule. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I don't. I don't want to use them all up because then I would be in trouble. Ah. But so I've used up 8,000 feet, but I've done. I've done 40 miles from 8,000 feet. Very simple. Uh, I'm an airplane instructor as well as a glider instructor. And there would be times when I'd be teaching someone in a Cessna 150 or a 172, and we'd do the simulated engine feather. You always learn how to deal with a simulated engine feather. I don't have to worry about that in glider. I don't have an engine feather. <laughs> but you would, you'd pull the throttle back and say, OK, you have a simulated engine feather. Where are you going to land? And they'd go, oh, I'm going to land right down there, which is a glide ratio of about one half. <laughs> yeah. And I would say, well, um, there's an airport over there. Let's see how close we can get to that airport. Oh, I don't think I can get it. Well, fly the best glide speed. Come <coughs> on over there. They always reach it. People, people just don't realize that even small airplanes have a pretty good glide ratio relative to what our eyes see, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes take a little piece of graph paper and take one block high and draw five out. That's not bad. Draw 40 out. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very shallow glide echo. And that's not the highest performance gliders that are typically being flown. I'm at the bottom of most 15 meter airplanes these days. My glider was designed in 1977. It looks brand new because I paid a lot of money yesterday, last year to get it all cleaned up, but it's, uh, it's a 40 year old glider. <clears throat> 40, yeah, 40 year old glider. Um, so, wait a minute. If I'm not competitive in 15 meter and I can't fly in standard because I have flaps and I don't have a wingspan to compete with the guys that have, you know, 100, you know, 80 to 100 foot wingspans, where do I compete? And the answer is sports class. Huh? No. <laughs> Next time you get on Condor, you got to stay in the air longer. <laughs> um, so sports class was developed in the early 70s because of the rapid rate of uh, aircraft design and performance increases. People would buy a glider, and four years later, it would be non-competitive. And when you're spending a lot of money for a glider, now back in those days, my glider sold for about 15000 When I bought it, I paid 23000 And when I sell it, because of all the things I've done, it'll be worth 35000 But the point is, um, the cost of a really nice glider can be had for anywhere from thirty down to ten. i I've seen some nice gliders for $10,000 right now. Um, the point is, they're not competitive in the class for which they were originally designed. So the sports class allows us to compete on a handicapped basis. 
Now, the handicap is not against the pilot, it's against the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically, my glider has a handicap value of 0.943. Okay? The, um, the L33 that Hood River Soaring has, has a handicap of 1. Uh, 1.12, I think. Which means that I have to go about 20% further in the same flight to beat that aircraft. Right. And so we go back to the idea of having these multiple circles. The multiple circles allow me to go in deeper and still complete the race. And the L-33 doesn't have to go as far, but could still win the race. Okay. So the handicap, same, what's that? still based on the same time, it's that longer distance. Exactly. It's longer. Yeah, it, and it's, all of these races, for the most part, are speed races. Yeah. They're not distance races. We don't do distance anymore. We only do speed. We just have several ways to determine what kind of speed we're doing. And again, if I wanted to compete in the 15 meter class, my bird, fit, my glider fits into that design class, um, my 40 to 1 would be competing against between 45 and 48 to 1. So that's quite a handicap against those other things. <coughs> so, now we're to the final topic of, the, of this thing here. Racing, right? Going as fast as we can. Going high doesn't matter anymore. Going far doesn't matter anymore. Going long, time, duration doesn't matter anymore. What we do is speed. And in competition, you just pick the class that you want to pay for. <laughs> um, you know, a, a 15 meter aircraft that would be competitive would cost about eighty to ninety thousand dollars. So I'm willing to fly in a lesser class <laughs> uh, in order to have an aircraft I can afford and enjoy. And, uh, and that's what. It is. So. Any questions I can answer here that I haven't already answered? You know, when, I, when I'm teaching my students, I say, if you don't have questions, I do. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? You sure? Well, thank you for letting me come, and I guess we're done. <laughs>